Greetings to you today from Botswana. I have a very important message that I need to share today, something the Lord has laid on my heart. It's something that I myself have been going through now for, for years, and I'm facing it again here in, uh, in Botswana. Not really very much different, uh, I wouldn't think, all around the world. But, uh, of course, the title of this is The Hardest Choices. And as believers, we have to make some very difficult choices. But I believe this message is, is a particular outreach, perhaps a particular outreach to someone, or perhaps a few, or maybe it will stick with someone to be there to uh, be considered at a later date. This will be in the Lord's hands. Many of you will not like what I'm going to say. I ask that you would be patient. Please evaluate everything prayerfully and through scripture and do as the Lord bids you. If you are a born again believer, then you have the Holy Spirit of God and he will direct you and he will direct you with the instrumentality of his word. And so I think you'll see that I lean very closely upon his word. I do have extensive scripture in the descriptions uh, for the various topics, the various uh, headings of this subject. And I always use the King James Bible. And so let's begin. Uh, please be patient with me if I have to look through scripture or whatnot uh, to read something. Most of this I have, I'm doing approximately from memory. That's why I list the scripture, because I want people to look it up for themselves. It is coming to that time in history where we really have to ask ourselves, how much do we love the Lord? Believe me, I don't pat myself on the back for this. Being an American, and as most would be in the Western world, and even as we see here in Africa, there is at least a, a fundamental freedom of religion. Uh, you can go to church, you can read a Bible, etc., etc. In truth, if you ever really try to live for the Lord in a deeper way, I mean, Satan will oppose you one way or another. But we're approaching this time in history, in fact, we are really in it now, where we have to make some hard choices. And, you know, we are supposed to give Jesus our lives. I mean, he saves our soul. He gave his life for us. He could gain nothing, in a sense, from our from uh, our meager abilities, which he gave to us anyway. You know, but it is a time to get serious about our relationship with him. Is Jesus your Lord? Do you seek him daily for guidance? Do you ask for his guidance in everything? As the scripture says, casting all our care upon him, for he cares for us. And I'm just asking you these questions uh, because the time is coming when you may have to make some hard choices for him. Yes, choices of life and death, but also as we see, will you go it alone? Are you willing to go it alone for the Lord? Because we are entering this time in history. Please remember that the Bible is our authority in all things. One of the things that I'm going to, to deal with a lot today, of course, is church. That is the organized church. Again, I, I say, and I think most people realize, that the church of the Bible is the body of Christ. They are bodies of believers. If you read in Corinthians, that's the church of the, church of the Corinthians. We have a noisy roof. We have the, the Church of the Corinthians is a group of believers that were in Corinth. This is not a building. This is not a denomination. It's not an organization. And that is almost all the time what is referred to as church. Where do you go to church? What is your church? When believers are already a part of the official church, the true church. And so I just want you to know that I am not opposed to this. I mean, it was years ago that the Lord began leading me and leading us away from organized religion. And I didn't even know he was doing it at the time, but this was his choice for us. And I had to see in the end, I said, wow, I, I don't think he's going to lead us anywhere. Why? And so I began looking at these things more deeply, asking my Lord, why? Because we wanted to be in a fellowship of believers. And I think right there is the problem. Because the organizations of men are not that. They are kind of a worldly pollution. And uh, we have to follow the Bible and not the teachings of men. 
And so I want to, what I wanted to point out to you is that the buildings are not the church. And God really doesn't have much respect for buildings. He just doesn't. You might say, well, what about the temple that was built? Yes, the temple that was built. And when David first presented this to him, that he wanted to do this, he told Nathan the prophet. And the first response he got, there were other elements of this, but the first response he got from God was, whoever told you to do this? When at any time did I tell you to have a building? I was with you wherever you went. I was with you when you led the sheep. To me, it sounded like he's saying, I was with you all the time. Why do you want to do this for me? Isn't it good? I think God always has always just wanted to walk with his people like he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. And that's what it sounded to me like in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 5 through 9. But we also see in recording about the temple, we see in several accounts, it just says, God will not dwell in a building made with human hands. The Almighty is too big for this. And so several times in scripture is referred to that uh, as Solomon said, uh, he was building a, a house for the name of the Lord. Because it just says, you know, God is too big. He can't be contained in a building. And so, so many people go there. They live their own lives the rest of the week, like they're meeting God in a certain place. But he's been with them all week long. And I'm sure he feels very neglected. We also have numerous scriptures here. From Isaiah, from Amos, God is not happy with the sacrifices. He's not happy with the songs. He's not happy with these things. He's looking at the heart. He's looking at the change. And it's just a ritual that is being gone through on the days they're supposed to gather together. But I'd like to read you specifically a little bit from the book of John. Perhaps that's no surprise. I love the book of John. But let's just listen to some of this. Please bear with me. We see this. This is with the woman at the well. Jesus says, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what, for we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And when he says that the hour comes, when you will neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father, to me it sounds like you will not worship in this church or in that church. It doesn't mean that you can't, it just means he wants you in spirit and in truth. He's looking for your heart connection. That's really what it is. I want to look to another Another time, this will be from John chapter 9. You might remember Jesus healed a, healed a blind man. He was blind from his birth. And this created some problems. But I want you to hear the problems that the church affiliation causes. Remember that the synagogue for the Jews would have been like today's church for us. They had the temple, but then the synagogue would have been their, their local place to worship, wherever that was. So we see this. I'm going to read. Verse 19, now the Pharisees, the Jews that were there, the Jewish leadership were asking this man's parents about him being healed by Jesus because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, which was a no-no. And they asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. You won't be allowed in church anymore. Wow, that's really terrible. You can't tell the truth or confess Jesus. Okay, these things do happen. Believe me, they happen. But one of the, the other dastardly things that's going on is this pressure to be in unity above all else. But let's continue in the word here for a moment. Now we see this. Ultimately, the man who was born blind was healed. He was also cast out. 
he was cast out of the synagogue because he confessed that Jesus was of God because he had done this. Okay, now we're going to jump over into chapter 12 and see again another problem. In verse 42, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, that is, they believed on Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I want you to know that when the, blind, the formerly blind man got kicked out of the synagogue, Jesus didn't tell him to go and find another synagogue. He asked if he believed in the Son of God. And that's where one of those famous places where Jesus openly confessed he was the Son of God. And the man who was healed worshipped him. He didn't say, go find another synagogue. I'm only trying to tell you, I don't, I don't despise anyone who goes to church and finds real fellowship and real learning and stuff from, from what's going on there, really washing their feet from the world. But you have to keep the Lord first. You have to keep your priorities straight. And we are in an age where things are pretty bad within the organized religions, and I'm seeing it. So I'm just saying this in case someone out there needs encouragement to stand up for what's true. My wife and I, both uh, in sharing, when we were each teenagers, we saw problems in the church, in the churches. But if we tried to say something, we were treated like scum. Because we said that we're supposed to be in unity. We're supposed to love everybody. But these people were not walking according to the scripture. And that's what counts. Now, as far as church itself goes, I've just, I've just referred you to this from, from John. There are troubles in church as we see. Church is not perfect, of course. We see from Mark chapter 1, we find that Jesus, in two verses, he's listed. One, he casts out, he is casting out uh, an unclean spirit from a man in the synagogue. And for the other, it says he is going through the synagogues, casting out devils. These were in the synagogues. These were in the churches. So it was. We see also in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 30, those in the synagogue got enraged with Jesus and they tried to drive him off the cliff. That was pretty nice, huh? The perfect son of God, you think they'd have shown him more love. This is what happened from the synagogue. Or if you can read from 1 Corinthians 5, this is an open rebuke to the church of Corinth because they had fornication going on in the church and Paul was rebuking it. It was actually a man having his father's wife. And these people were boasting in it. They were puffed up about it. They were not repenting. And so these are examples of how bad things can come into the church. And, and we need to stand against them. We don't necessarily need to dissolve the whole church. But my word, we have to stand up for what's right. Uh, because we are all prone uh, to making mistakes. Now there are also scriptures I have here pertaining to unity. Unity is highly overrated. There is nothing in the concept of unity itself that is holy. Unity among true brethren is wonderful. But the Bible makes it clear also in what it says, that unity is in everything. As I read here, one time they were in unity was when David was first trying to bring the ark up to Jerusalem. It says he had 30,000 chosen men of Israel to help him. And it said that what he was doing was good in the eyes of all Israel. So you see, David was act actually had a good motive. He had a good intention, but in the, in the end, he didn't do it the way that God wanted him to. And so this caused a breach upon Uzzah, and uh, it ruined the whole ceremony that should have been an honor to God. But it just shows that unity itself, even by well-intended people, is in everything. It is obedience that God wants, not sacrifice. We see again from 1 Kings chapter 22, verse, I have highlighted verses 6 and 13. This is where uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat were going up to battle together against the kings of Syria. And 400 lying prophets told Ahab that he was going to prevail. The prophets came and they said, go up, you will prevail. 400. But only Micaiah stood against it. And it said that they were all in unity Good things were going to happen when Ahab did this. So you see that the unity of the many really doesn't accomplish anything. Uh, I have a number of other verses here 
But one thing I would like to point out is from Revelation 13, 8, all the world will be united under the Antichrist. That's not a good unity. So unity itself doesn't mean anything. If you read from a, a better unity that we're supposed to have, that would be in 1 Corinthians 10 to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 to 13. But that says we're all supposed to believe the same thing. Wow, we don't really see that much anymore with all of these denominations and new ones coming up all the time. And I say often that this is the church of anything goes. And it really is. And they just tolerate anything goes. They are not built upon the doctrine of the word of God. Now, we also have from Scripture, we have directions to separate. Why do people keep pushing unity when God says, I don't want it? I don't want unity at all costs. There are times in my word I tell you to pull apart. I don't understand how this can be missed, especially when we are so warned about deception in these last days. We see this in Luke chapter 12, where Jesus is saying that he will bring division. There will be five in one house, three against two, two against three. That's by what? Standing up for him and standing up for the truth. We are told to pull away from unbelief. And if that unbelief is in, in the supposed church, we need to pull away from it. This is from Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is he that walketh not in the counsel of the God, ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. This is where we should be. 1 Corinthians 15.33, bad company corrupts good morals. We see it in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. It tells us that we are supposed to withdraw from those that are not holding the doctrine of Christ. In 2 Timothy 3.5, we are supposed to turn away that have, from those that have a form of godliness that have denied the power. And also in Titus 3.10, we are to separate from ourselves heretics after we have given them an admonition once or twice, we put them away. We don't tolerate that. But if everyone in the, in the building is going along with the heretic, then we have to leave also. Don't you see we have to make a choice? In the end, every one of us will give an account to God for himself. We're not going to be approved by who we know or what we do in that way. Oh, well, everybody liked me. Jesus said, didn't you see the scripture where I said, woe unto you if all men speak well of you? Didn't you see that? Oh, I missed that one, Lord. Well, you sure had long enough to find it, didn't you? And I didn't hide it from you. So please, we need to take a stand for the Lord before it is too late. And not only that, I would just reiterate to you the conditions of the end times. You need to know. You need to know this. It's not nice, okay? Religion will be everywhere, but real Christianity will not be found. I mean, it will be very, very well, nearly extinct. As Jesus even said, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? But as we see, we can see that this is the picture of a scattered church. As we read in the book of Daniel, in chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, Daniel is asking the man that's telling him these things, how long, how long until the end of these things? And he says, until the power of the holy people has been scattered. I'm sorry I don't have better news for you, but this is why we really need to cement our relationship with the Lord, lean on him more fully in prayer than we have ever done. And it may mean, it may mean that we have to separate from churches. And I know that that can be very difficult. And again, I don't tell you to do it. You have to follow the Lord. And if he hasn't shown you, well, then don't. But I wanted to encourage you because this is the way indeed that the Lord has led us. I think I'm going to look up one other scripture here. You know, we have to be, maybe two. I don't want to be a liar. But I'm going to look up one other scripture here quickly from the book of Acts in chapter 20. We need to be wary of the deceit that enters in. We need to really be vigilant. For I know this, that after my departing, this is Paul talking, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, 
I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Why would he say that? Why would he say such a thing? Why not just leave us together with them, huh? He is warning us. We need to come apart. We need to take our stand for the Lord. I want you also, though, this was the other scripture I thought of when I said maybe not just one. We're going to go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 66. And I'll read verses 1 and 2 here. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Even from this scripture, it sounds like God doesn't put a lot of value on the house that we have built for him, because all of these things have come from his hand. He is blessed by it as we are walking in him. But the building itself doesn't mean anything. And so gatherings of believers can happen anywhere. That's really what we're looking at, the gathering of true believers. Maybe you want to gather together with some more serious-minded of your church or something like that. But I encourage you not to let anything stand in the way. I'm going to give you this sobering word. This is again from Isaiah 66. And I take this to be prophecy of the end. And I will expound on it, whether you agree or not. That's between you and the Lord. It's just in verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified. But he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Do you see this? He's talking, he's encouraging those that tremble at his word. Frankly, that is me. I've trembled at his word for a long time. Do you tremble at his word? But it says that your brethren will hate you and cast you out for his name's sake. They'll say they're doing it in the name of the Lord. And they'll say, let the Lord be glorified. We got rid of them. But he will appear to your joy and they shall be ashamed because that's what will happen at the end. That's what will happen when the real Jesus comes. They'll know they've been duped by the Antichrist for over three and a half years, and they'll say, "Uh uh-oh. Oh, we don't want anything bad for anyone, brethren. But I'm trying to give you a sobering warning. This is the kind of commitment that we need to have toward Jesus Christ. We need all of his power. Please thank you for listening to this. Please regard it prayerfully. God bless.